Hey guys, my name is Shreyas and welcome to Simple Biology. Today we're going to be talking about functional groups. Now functional groups are chemical groups that change the chemical and physical properties of a molecule and they can be considered as the building blocks for biomolecules. We already talked about carbon cell skeletons and hydrocarbons and how those can be considered the backbone for biomolecules. Now we're going to be looking at actual groups of um, atoms which can be added on to top, onto a carbon skeleton and create biomolecules. Um, just to give you a metaphor, the hydrocarbons which we talked about the first video in this unit, we talked about how that would be um, like the the skeleton of a body, and then you ha in your body you have the tissue and the skins and the muscle. In the same sense, functional groups are kind of like the extra um, thing that's added on on top of the skeleton in your body. You can also think of like the carbon skeleton being the bread of the cake, and then you put icing on it. The functional groups would be considered the icing. Okay. And I think that'll make more sense as we go through these seven functional groups that you need to know. So the first functional group is a hydroxyl group, and that is an oxygen atom bo bonded to a hydrogen atom, and then there's a single bond which can bond um, to anything else. Okay. And it's a polar functional group because um, the electrons spend time near the oxygen atom. We saw, we saw this in water, how oxygen pulls on the electrons within the covalent bond. Um, in the first unit. In the same sense, this oxygen atom right here is going to pull on the electrons, um, the electron which, within the single bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen, and that's going to make the oxygen atom have a partial negative charge and the hydrogen atom have a partial positive charge. So whenever a hydroxyl group is added to a, a molecule, it makes that molecule more soluble in water. Um, and typically molecules which have a hydroxyl groups are called um, alcohols. Um, this right here is methanol. This is an example of a um, an alcohol, and as you can see, there is a hydroxyl group right here. Okay. Now our second functional group is the carbonyl group, and it creates ketones and aldehydes. A carbonyl group looks something like this. It's going to be a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, and then there's two other bonds which can bond to something else. Now a ketone is when that this this carbonyl group right here is in um, is in another chain of molecules. As you can see, the, um, the carbonyl group here is being bonded to one group on the left and then another group on the right. Okay, so that's a ketone. An aldehyde is whenever the carbonyl group is at the end of a molecule. As you can see here, the carbonyl group here is at the very end of the molecule. Okay, it's at the very end. There, we have a group right here and then it's the carbonyl group is at the very end. So that's an aldehyde. And ketones and aldehydes are um, present in sugars, and we're going to see a lot of carbonyl groups um, as we look at more biomolecules throughout biology. So that's the second group you need to know. Now let's go to the third group. The third group is a carboxyl group, and it creates carboxylic acids or organic acids. And I'll show you what I mean by that here. This is the carboxyl group here. It's going to be um, there's a single, there's a, I mean, there's a carbon bo bonded to oxygen, double bonded to an oxygen atom, and then it's also single bonded to um, OH, and then there is a uh, single bond right here which can bond to something else. So, for example, we have here we have a example of an organic acid. This is um, this is I believe this is propanoic acid. That's besides the point. Um, but as you can see here, we have we have a group right here, and then this, we have a carboxyl group attached to it, and there's a single bond. And then the reason why they're called acids is because the, hydro, the hydrogen atom within the carboxyl group can ionize. So as we see here, the hydrogen atom can be released from this OH within the carboxyl group, and then that will leave the oxygen atom um, having an partial uh, a negative charge and then this hydrogen atom which is released can go and bond to water to create hydronium and because of that um, this is called an acid because there's a hyd it can increase the concentration of hydronium in water we talked about what acids are this H plus would go bond to a water molecule and create hydronium so therefore this whole molecule is an acid and an organic acid is um, whenever we have a carboxyl group okay so that's the second point hydrogen atom can ionize from the carboxyl group uh, and create um, hydronium. Okay, and then whenever you f look at the carboxyl group, it's found in cells in the ionized form. So for example, if you found this compound in a cell, 
it would not look like this. It would be in the ionized form with the hydrogen atom already ionized and the oxygen um, atom having a partial negative charge. Okay, it's found in cells in the ionized form, like this, not like this. Okay, so that's our uh, third, let's look at our fourth functional group. This is the amino group, and it creates amines. Any, any um, compound, any molecule which has an amino group is typically an amine, and it acts as a base. This acts as an acid, the carboxyl group. Now, amines are, act as a base. And an amino group looks like this. It looks like a nitrogen atom bonded to two, single bonded to two hydrogen atoms, and then there's another single bond for this to attach to another molecule. If you look here, we have an example. This is called methylamine, and um, we can see the amino group right here. We have the nitrogen and the two hydrogen atoms, and then the single bond to another group right here. And it acts as a base because this nitrogen atom right here has a tendency to pull hydrogen atoms. So let me go ahead and dry that. We talked about how a base can do either two things, either decrease the hydro hydroxide ion, I mean, increase the hydroxide ion concentration of water or decrease the hydronium ion concentration. So what this would do is um, amino groups tend to, let's say we have hydronium like this. And then we have our atom right here. So what would happen is that the nitrogen atom would um, actually pull this um, hydrogen atom and there and it would come this hydrogen atom would come and be attracted to the nitrogen atom and then this hydronium uh, um, ion would just turn into water or H2O so therefore it acts as a base because it pulls off it, it con converts hydronium into water therefore decreasing hydronium ion concentration of its environment okay and then just like how we, s we saw um, here Carboxyl groups are found in the ionized form as CO, and then the other oxygen atom having a partial, neg uh, having a negative charge. In the same sense, amino groups are not found like this. Whenever you find an amino group in a cell, it's typically going to already have an hydrogen atom attached to it, and and it'll have a partial positive charge, which I've drawn here. It's found in the ionized form. Okay. Now the next group we're looking at we're going to look at is the sulfhydryl group, and that creates thiols. And it's similar to the hydroxyl group because just like here we saw the oxygen atom having that electronegativity and pulling the, um, creating a, a polar functional group. Similarly, the sulfhydryl group, sorry, the sulfhydryl group, the sulfur within the sulfhydryl group is going to pull on the electrons and then um, also have that uh, polarity displayed. The sulfur atom is going to have a partial negative charge and the hydrogen atom is going to have a partial positive charge just like how in hydroxyl groups the oxygen atom has a partial negative charge and the hydrogen atom has a partial positive charge. So it creates thiols. Okay, that's the type of compound that's created whenever we look at sulfidyl groups. And it's similar to the hydroxyl group. I just explained that. And it's polar, again, because the sulfur atom is very um, electronegative and it's going to pull on the electrons within the bond. And whenever you have sulfidyl groups attached to a molecule, it makes the molecule more soluble in water because it's going to make the molecule more polar. Okay, and it plays an important role in proteins, and we're going to see that um, later down the road in this um, unit. This is an example of a compound, as you can see here, there's a sulfhydryl group, and then um, there's a single bond, and then this, it's also bonded to another group right here. Okay, so that's the sulfhydryl group. Now let's look at our next group. This is a phosphate group, and whenever you have phosphate groups bonded to atoms, they create, bonded to uh, molecules, they create organic phosphates. And this is how a phosphate group looks like. It looks like a, um, you have a phosphate atom in the very middle, and then it's double bonded to an oxygen, and then it's also bonded to three other oxygen atoms. And, um, I mean, I'm sorry, it's bonded to two oxygen atoms here. Each of these oxygen atoms have a partial negative charge. This is going to have a minus one charge. This is going to have a minus one charge. And then this other oxygen atom right here um, can single bond to another group. So we can say, for example, this could bond to, let's say, carbon like this. So that's an example of how it can bond. These two oxygen atoms have partial negative charges, and this oxygen atom right here can single bond to another group. Okay? And Phosphate groups play an important role in many chemical reactions in biology, and we're again going to see this. And um, whenever a phosphate group um, bonds to a molecule, it creates a negative charge for the molecule. So as you can see here, if this if this phosphate group had bonded to this molecule right here, like I just drew, um, 
it would create a, a negative charge because these two oxygen atoms that right here each have a minus one charge. Okay. Oh, and this too. So whenever a phosphate group bonds to an ox uh, bonds to a molecule, since there's a negative charge right here, um, it will make the molecule more soluble in water, because since now that the uh, molecule will have a um, a separation of charges, it would make the molecule more uh, soluble in water, which is important to remember. Okay, I'm not going to write that down, but just know that phosphate groups also, just like how the sulfhydryl group and the hydroxyl group um, make uh, molecules more soluble in water, same thing with the phosphate group. Okay. Now, the methyl group is um, whenever you have a, com a compound which uh, has a, a lot of methyl groups in it, you, you call it a methylated compound, and it plays an important role in genetics, and a, the methyl group is just this. It's a carbon bonded to three hydrogen atoms, and it's also um, single bonded to, there's a single bond which can bond to something else. Okay. Now, I know this is a lot of information knowing these, um, uh, these seven, I think there's seven, yes, seven uh, groups. But the most important thing that you should know, um, at least for the AP biology test, is just what the groups are. Um, so if I say this is OH, what group is this? This is a hydroxyl group. And if I say C double bond O, what is that? That's a carbonyl group. So those are the only, um, that's the most important thing. These properties, these bullet points I have here are not really that important to know because as we actually go through biology, you're going to notice these, um, all these seven functional groups popping up all over the place. And then whenever you, um, see that those, um, groups popping up all over the place, then you're going to, you're not going to have to actually come and memorize this because you'll just know it. For example, whenever we look at genetics, we're going to be talking about methyl groups. So um, whenever we get to that point in biology, you'll already know, oh, okay, I remember Shreyas mentioned methyl groups earlier, and now we're actually seeing how it plays a role in genetics. So it's not really important that you know these bullet points. The important thing that you know, at least for now, is just being able to, if you're given the name, be able to draw the group, or if, you, if I draw the group, then being able to identify the name. Okay. And then, just for fun here, I have an ex example of how um, functional groups can uh, alter the structure of a molecule here. So, right here I've drawn a very complicated um, molecule. This is Adderall. And as, as we can see here, we've learned a lot of things in this past three videos, and I'm going to point those th three things out. As you can see here, we can see our carbon skeleton like this, this carbon skeleton right here, and we, and we have a nice ring here. And then we can see from here um, the carbon branches out like this to form um, another group of carbons. So we have the ring and then we have um, a branch. And then here on this side of the branch we have a this right here. This is a methyl group. That's a methyl group because you can see the carbon bonded to three hydrogen atoms and then being single bonded to another group. This is a methyl group, so we see the same thing here, carbon bonding to three hydrogen atoms. So that's a methyl group. And then we also see an amino group here because we have um, a nitrogen atom being bonded to two hydrogen atoms. And let me see if I can find that. Uh, amino group is nitrogen bonded to two hydrogen atoms and then being bonded to something else. So we can see that here too, nitrogen being bonded to two hydrogen atoms and then being bonded to this carbon right here. So that right there is in amino group. So we can see how everything is starting to come together. We talked about the carbon skeleton in um, the hydrocarbon video and now we see the functional groups and now you can kind of start to see how all these things come together to create complex compounds like this. Um, this by the way is Adderall which is a uh, compound used to help people with ADHD to make them focus. Um, but yeah, now, I hope you understand that this is not just memorization. You can actually see how everything is coming together and how these little building blocks, functional groups, and then the carbon skeleton come together to create amazing compounds. But that's all you have to know about functional groups. As you can see, functional groups are as simple as that.